Hello and welcome to my strategy guide for Abyss. My name is Sam and today we're going to discuss how to use your turns most effectively while also touching on all the lords and how to prioritize recruiting them. This will just be about the base game with a guide on the expansions to come later. Let's start by talking about the point value of each resource. Pearls, keys, monster tokens and allies. More than half of your turns are going to be spent collecting these so it's important to have an idea of their relative value. Allies are pretty straightforward. You can consider the number on the ally card to be approximately equivalent to how many points they will gain you. While you won't get one point for every one seahorse you have in your hand, spending them to buy lords will give you about that much value. When it comes to the four and five ally cards, they should be valued a bit higher, as you'll be able to use their buying power as well as score points for their affiliation. Even if you already have a five shellfish affiliated, a four shellfish can be useful for helping affiliate a four of another race. Monster tokens give flat points, so are easy to evaluate. Most of the time you will either get a two or three point token, so they can be averaged out at two and a half points each, with the small upside of possibly getting a four point token. The value of keys can vary a lot, but I would average it out to about three to four points per key. A good location makes them worth more, a bad location less, and there's always the risk of not getting three keys to unlock a location at all. Pearls are worth nothing at the end of the game, but for the purpose of buying lords can be considered as worth about one and a half points each. They have upside in helping you affiliate high number allies as well as being necessary to buy said high number allies from opponents. With these values in mind, we can look at each action you can take during a turn and how to get the most out of them. When exploring, the worst result possible is worth two and a half points. That would be reaching the end and receiving a one ally and a pearl. Anything better than this should be seen as a win. Taking a four or five ally card would be ideal. Don't worry too much about the colors, they are all useful when recruiting. Don't worry about revealing high numbers for your opponents either. This is an inevitable part of the game and being rewarded with pearls for doing so is not a bad thing. Taking a 3 ally card is slightly better, but exploring until the end may be a better option for a bigger upside. It depends how the council stacks are looking. If the shellfish council stack already has a few cards in it, it's probably unwise to pass on a 3 shellfish and allow your opponent to take everything. Looking at the monster track, the second level looks the most appealing, even more so than the third level. If given the option, taking the second level reward of two monster tokens worth five points on average is a good result. The only time I would not take monster tokens is if the hunter is available, allowing your opponent to steal one and essentially waste your turn. Your other main way of collecting resources is by taking a stack of cards from the council. The question most of the time is should I explore or should I take this stack? And now that you know how much exploring gives, it's easier to calculate whether to explore or whether to stack. Stacks with four or more cards should be taken most of the time. Exploring instead runs the risk of adding to that stack and giving your opponents too much. Keep track of where the three ally cards and possibly even four ally cards land. Any stack with at least a three ally card and one other card is worth taking. Value your pearls when buying allies from an opponent. Don't buy three ally cards. Make your opponent decide if they are going to settle for a three or send it to the council. Buying a three gives you little value as you lose a pearl while your opponent gains a pearl. Five ally cards are always worth buying while four ally cards are worth buying most of the time. If playing with three or more players is very rarely a good move to spend two pearls for an ally, maybe only if it's a five of a race you need. You don't always need to rush to buy lords. Sometimes the better move is to wait. Some lords, like a few I'm about to mention, are worth racing for. Other times, waiting until you have a good hand of allies can help you affiliate more effectively and give you more options when the court is refilled. Gaining two pearls from refilling the court is a nice bonus and can help snowball you into buying another lord sooner. Look to do this when possible. The only downside to amassing a giant collection of allies is the commander showing up, which we'll talk about shortly. If the commander is already gone, collect away. Be aware of how many lords and allies your opponents have, and don't collect too many that you won't be able to use them all. It's a fine balance that can only come with experience and sometimes luck. 
Affiliation is where a lot of handy points come from. Aim to score at least 15 points from at every game. There are many strong laws which facilitate high affiliations, so aim to recruit as many as possible. As a general rule, high numbers and low numbers do not mix. There is nothing worse than using a 5 ally and affiliating a 1. Use high numbers together to ensure strong affiliations, and use low numbers together to utilise their buying power. Plotting is gambling a pearl for a chance at a better lord. It doesn't pay off too often. Avoid doing this unless it's the last round or you have nothing to lose by doing so. These are two lords you need to watch out for and actively play around. The Shipmaster is the strongest lord in the game early on, and if available should be your first target. Out of a total of 35 lords, 6 are displayed at the beginning of the game, so this will be the case in about 1 in every 6 games. At best, the Shipmaster can give you a benefit of 4 pearls per turn, which is unmatched by any other lord. While it's tempting to use that power every turn, it's important to remember that by doing so you are also filling up the council stacks at a rapid rate. So while you are gaining great value from pearls, your opponents are also gaining value by taking a large amount of cards in one turn. Don't go overboard on using the power, take stacks as well. Use the early lead the shipmaster is giving you to finish the game early. If you can reach 7 lords while your opponents are sitting on 4 or 5 each, it's highly unlikely you'll lose the game. The commander is strong for the opposite reasons. While gaining no benefit yourself, you can completely block opponents into wasting turns and being inefficient. If you can actually force your opponents to discard allies when first bought, it can be completely devastating. If the council is left with only expensive lords, or lords with specific colour requirements your opponents don't have, they will have no choice but to explore and discard. If you can hold them hostage in this state for multiple turns, you will have gained a huge advantage. If the commander is available, be very wary holding more than 6 allies. If the commander has not been seen yet, it's probably best to stay under 10 allies unless you have protection. Now I'm going to go over every other lord in less than 12 seconds each. The alchemist's power is quite strong and can offer a lot of value. Opponents will usually play around it by taking council stacks more often or exploring less. Decent points and a good opportunity to affiliate a 4 or 5 jellyfish. The apprentice is very cheap for the amount of points on offer. Depending on the stacks available is usually worth between 10 to 15 points. One lord I will always look to buy. These three farmer lords all give great points and opportunity to affiliate an ally of three or more. I'll always try to work towards them if available. The assassin is only useful for negating an opponent's key or lord power. It can be annoying to play against, but the dead lord can be replaced with the help of the schemer or traitor, which makes it a big investment for not much gain. The corruptor itself doesn't give many points for its cost, but its power is where the value lies. Spending 5 pearls to recruit another lord is incredible value and worth the effort. Best used to recruit hard to buy lords, like the ambassadors. The power of the diplomat can come in handy in specific situations, but doesn't offer a lot during most turns. Not a lord I'd look to get early, but maybe later for a third key. The ambassadors are worthwhile when you consider the average location gives 9 to 12 points. The downside is if buying them directly, your affiliation is going to be bad. Having the choice of locations is better than an extra point or two, so the Elder is the best of the bunch. The Hunter is only really worth buying if your opponent has a monster token. Worst case, you steal a 2 point token, in which case the Hunter gives you 8 points and makes your opponent lose 2. The upside is stealing a higher point token, in which case the point swing is larger. The Illusionist is expensive for its points, so should generally only be bought if you need to make use of its power. That's going to be very situational, so most games is avoided. The Invoker is a much better option to spend your Jellyfish on. An extra turn can give you a lot of momentum, helping you finish the game sooner. If you have enough allies, you can even surprise your opponents by going from 5 lords to 7 lords in one swoop. Another lord I'll always look to buy. The Jailer gives below average points for not having a key, and its power is very underwhelming. Discarding a one ally is not too impactful and not worth the low amount of points. 
The three farmer lords with keys are useful for being the third key to unlock a location, as they're worth more points than a normal lord with a key. Don't look to buy them early, as they have no power to benefit you unlike other lords with keys. The landlord is a fantastic early lord, and if purchased, should remain uncovered for as long as possible. Having the landlord active for 10 turns will give you an insane amount of benefit, often enough to snowball the game in your favour. The Master of Magic is great for simplifying affiliation, and gives you a lot more flexibility in which lords you can recruit. It can turn an average affiliation score of 15 into the low 20s easily. Very useful, but not completely necessary to affiliate well. The Opportunist gives you the opportunity to see the next lord before your opponents can react to it, which can be useful, but most of the time not. I think there are much better powers to focus on than this one. The Oracle suffers a similar fate, in that the power is not too impactful. It allows you to explore with a bit more freedom, knowing you can discard a stack of cards afterwards, but that doesn't give you too much benefit. It's okay as a third key lord and good for affiliation. The three merchant lords are among the best in the game for flat points, and if you consider pearls as one and a half points each, then the trader ranks as the best. The extra pearls can give you a much needed boost and help you finish the game sooner. The other benefit of recruiting the trader is you get the lord with the biggest boost. The recruiter is similar to the assassin, annoying to play against but not game breaking. Still worth buying, but important to remember, the annoyance of paying extra for lords is countered by the extremely low point value. The pain can most be felt when trying to buy the high cost single ally cards like the landowner. The schemer and traitor are most useful for removing an assassinated lord. Other than that, their point value is quite low for their cost. Not having a key or high point value makes them pretty dead weight when it comes to scoring. The seeker gives great value if your opponents have pearls to discard. 7 points for you, and minus 3 for your opponents. Also very easy to affiliate a 3 or 4 ally. If recruiting, be prepared for your family to never play Abyss with you again. The Shaman is quite strong, allowing you to play with freedom, and making each Soldier Lord worse for your opponents to buy. Even blocking only one Soldier Lord power will make it worthwhile. The Slaver is another great Lord for the early and mid game. You can essentially turn a 1 ally into 3 points each turn. If you recruit the Slaver, it's best to prioritise taking stacks of cards to get the most out of its power. The Tamer is probably the worst lord in the game, offering little points for an underwhelming power. Your opponents will ignore monsters until the track reaches the key, and in the rare case that they are forced to fight, it will cost them one monster token at best. The Treasurer is another underwhelming lord to finish off the list. The cheap lords are already cheap enough that the Treasurer won't make a real difference, and a lot of the time, it will make you affiliate worse allies or overpay to affiliate better. Not the worst, but also a lord I wouldn't rush to get. Not much needs to be said about locations. They all score points dependent on your setup, so the best ones will change from game to game. When choosing a location, if there are none you like available, always draw 4. There's no reason to not give yourself the biggest choice possible. The Chamber of Allies is considered to be one of the strongest locations for any setup, provided you haven't affiliated poorly so far. The City of Mirrors is safe in games with a high player count, as it's likely by the end of the game there will be a nice location for you to copy. Otherwise just pick the best available. Anything over 10 points is a decent return. Hopefully these tips can help. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. I make strategy videos every week, so if that's the sort of content you enjoy, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching and good luck.